Today I'm presenting some work that's joint work with uh, Marcus Mobius and Yino Pal, um, who was uh, an intern with us uh, last summer. And so this work is actually sort of makes sense for me to kick things off because this paper, this, our project is a little bit broader than the other two. Um, we've been actually working on this for a number of years. Um, trying to really wrap our heads around how the way people access news affects the kinds of news that they read. And so um, we've been doing this work at Microsoft Research using toolbar browsing data where we get to see sort of all of the, the internet usage for a set of users um, potentially over a long period of time. And so this, what, what we've been, you know, in some earlier work, we looked at the things like news aggregators and saw that news aggregators, using a natural experiment, we found that news aggregators really changed qualitatively the way that people look at news. Like if you start using, if a new set of content, in this case local news, comes, on to, comes online, we saw that people were really reading much more diverse news, news from a lot of different sources and shifting their composition of news. And so those findings from that natural experiment were um, very suggestive, but also it re was a relatively small sample of users we could see impacted. We were looking at users from France. And so we wanted to go on to really more fully characterize what people are reading. So the, the thing that we've spent most of our time focusing on is trying to really characterize the content of people's news. It's really a huge measurement exercise, which is why the measurement part of it has really taken years. We've tried an, a whole bunch of different ways to categorize news. We've come up with a way after trying and rejecting, you know, countless methods, some really cool, some things that are really giving us very cool results and matching up very well with that. So I'm going to sort of focus some on the measurement. I want to say though today, most of the project is focused on, you know, very broad measurement, all different attributes of news. So today I'm going to just report on, in the given it's a short time period, just the part on political bias and polarization. But we don't have as much depth on like polarization and segregation because that's just like one of 30 variables that we're, we're looking at. So a broader kind of uh, you know, motivation for the project, we're trying to understand how social media affects the composition of news consumption and the equilibrium level of informativeness. So some questions like, well, as social media becomes more important, will people consume relatively less or more political and science news? Will there be an increase in trendy topics versus long-term issues? Will there be less neutral and more biased news? Is there polarization? And so one of the things that makes this whole project you know, very challenging, and one reason you kind of, I feel like you have to sort of start with description and then get more and more sort of structured, is that when somebody looks at a web page, that's really sort of an equilibrium outcome. Um, you know, we normally think in like I.O., there's a lot of I.O. people here. You, know, you have a set of products, and that set of products is determined maybe once for a city, and then a whole bunch of different people make a choice from that same set of products. But in terms of browsing the web, you know, you're, everybody's basically getting their own choice set presented to them. And it's presented to them depending on whether they go to aggregators and social media and then within social media on who their friends are. So, it, so it's, it's, it's very hard to sort of de to really break out the, um, what you're seeing in using kind of more as, as the, our standard kind of frameworks of, disc of discrete choice or just user choice. Production is jointly determined by what outlets produce and users share. And, and so even on what you see on the screen is sort of already an equilibrium outcome. And of course, what people share depends on what they read. Um, so this is going to, and we're not going to solve this at all. I just want to sort of highlight this as part of like the overall research agenda and why it's going to take us all collectively years to really sort it out. Um, and then, of course, consumption is a selection from what's produced. So there's really kind of two different kinds of challenges for empirical research. The first is sort of measurement and description. So we've spent, as I said, years kind of just trying to characterize the news people are reading from different sources. What are the attributes of the news? Their political bias, article quality, its emotional content, um, whether it has first person narratives, whether it makes you want to go and do something. And of course, when we're, if we want to really understand the equilibrium level of informative society, it's important that like maybe social media leads you to articles that make you want to go and donate to a campaign and go and vote and other things don't or vice versa. So, so, we, so part of what we want to characterize is these more subtle attributes of articles which really are at the heart of the economic policy implications. But we want to get this at scale. And so part of what we've been trying to do is sort of combine pure data mining and machine learning techniques with other techniques to make sure that we can really measure these things accurately. Um, for, in terms of description, we want to take a user per perspective. So we want to think about how 
do the, the patterns of what you read depend on the attributes of the outlet, the attributes of the topics, and the mode of access, where, where you came from social media or a, a news web page. For example, how does the political biasness of your, your news consumption depend on social media access, and how is that different for different user types? That's a question I'll answer today, or I'll show you some evidence about today. Um, but we also want to take the outlet perspective, because really the, the ultimate kind of counterfactual questions have to do with what would really outlet decisions. So if you look at an outlet's perspective, an outlet's audience is going to be different. They get a different audience from Facebook and a different audience from news aggregators and a different audience from search. They might look at these audiences and say, ah, you know, everything's going to social media and social media users like X. So it's important from an outlet's perspective to understand, well, is a social media audience different just because it's different users? And if my old users switch over to social media, they'll keep reading the same thing? Or is it that people just really behave fundamentally different um, when they come from social media, so my old users will turn into my new users, and so in the future, everybody's going to want a different kind of news. So just you know, some examples of, and we're not going to perfectly answer um, these. We're not going to have a structural model. I think I'm a ways away from having a structural model to really fully quantify so counterfactual questions. But these are more qualitative questions that motivate what you want to do. What would happen if a user starts using social media more? Maybe the Boston Marathon, which is our time period, they see that, they sign up for Twitter, and then they start reading their news from Twitter where they didn't before. What happens if users maintain their topic mix but shift outlets? So if an outlet does some advertising and gets you to come, but you were inherently interested in government topics. Um, how does an audience change as social media penetration increases? And does the increase in social media utilization create incentives for outlet to create different types of articles? So those are broadly the kinds of things we're interested in. So data description, I'm going to go through this super fast. Um, so we have several million anonymous users, um, something like uh, 40 million page views. We're going to get URLs and timestamps by user ID. And we have refer referrer ideas, which also have to be somewhat inferred probabilistically. So you don't know for sure exactly that they came from Facebook, but we have to look at the timing and say you couldn't actually get to the middle of a website in a URL that's like got 300 characters unless somebody referred you there and you were just at Facebook, therefore it's a referral. The article data, we're then going to take our URL data, we're going to merge it with the Bing algo index, which is what's used to serve Bing search, and we're going to pull down all the text of all of the articles that people are reading. Um, we also spent a lot of work, actually just a couple of months, coming up with our news outlet list because we thought that one thing that might be happening is that social media is going to send you to different outlets and smaller outlets. So just focusing on big outlets could give you a very distorted image. So we used a combination of data mining and crowdsourcing to identify 10,000 news outlets and make sure that those tail ones were actually news outlets. Um, so we also look at the supply side, but I'm not going to show you that today. So in terms of classifying articles, basic text mining is what you know, most people do, and I'm a big fan of it. We construct features of articles um, and then use text mining to try to, um, to, try to derive the features. What, what we found is that many features cannot be accurately constructed with this approach, or at least using existing approaches. The error rates were too high. They weren't really capturing what we were looking for. So we're going to use crowdsourcing to crowdsource a rich set of characteristics for the articles. But of course, there the, the problem is cost and sample size. And so part of our solution is that we're going to classify groups of articles into topics. And we find that roughly 2 thirds of page views can be classified into roughly like 200 topics using this method, a pure uh, text mining method. And then we're going to crowdsource features of the topics. So it's the IRS scandal, the Bing Zai scandal. And then we can apply that data and cover 2 thirds of, of web pages. But we're also going to crowdsource the articles themselves. And we'll be able to do some things on the smaller samples. So we have a few thazand articles we can use for, um, for our work. So we have two different ways. We have a, a basic Wikipedia categorization where we just match up articles to existing Wikipedia articles. So most news, news stories actually have their own dedicated Wikipedia article, and that works very well. So the Bing's Eye Scandal has its own Wikipedia article. On the other hand, a lot of things don't have their own Wikipedia article. So then we use a more complex method that basically looks at networks of, of terms and puts groups of articles that are in the, a closed subnetwork into a topic. And that actually worked amazingly well. And we tried a whole bunch of other stuff, and nothing came close to that, even though it's kind of ad hoc. So we stuck with that. And then the last third, we can't classify very well in that way. And they're sort of diffuse in minor local topics. We crowdsource them to, using Amazon. Here are just some examples of some of our topics. So we're, we're doing April of last year, Ariel Castro, murder of Travis Alexander, and so on. Um, I should mention that, that there's a few things that can, can be ambiguous. So like 
If you have a gay NFL player coming out, then this is a sports article, but it's also potentially politically biased. And so some things that looked funny in our raw data actually turned out to be right. So the article was about the NFL, but it also had potential political bias. Okay. So we have a crowdsourcing platform where we ask people to, for the topics, we give them examples of articles, we show them a Wikipedia article, if there exists one, and then we give them lots of questions. So here are some examples of some of the questions we ask, um, and there's, there's actually a bunch more as well. Are the articles politically biased about a recent event? Um, is this politically, ethic ethically, or socially controversial? Is it an opinion article? Does it have in-depth research? One of, the th we have a, one of the other areas that's relevant for this session is would reading articles on this topic make you want to vote or donate money and so on. And we, we get this by having like hierarchical questions. So you click on something and then another menu opens up so you don't sort of overwhelm the workers. Okay, so polarization in social media. So let me start with, and I should say by the way, today we're just, I'm just going to be giving you kind of taste because our paper isn't really organized around this topic. So I'm going to sort of show you a variety of facts that I think are interesting for this problem. So we see that, um, that what, what we look here first is we're going to try to characterize outlet to audiences. So here's a list of domains. And then I'm, here's some characteristics of their users. So the user's fraction of articles that are from potentially polarized topics, and the user's fraction of articles from Huffington Post. So what we see is that the um, the outlets get different audiences from direct, direct navigation and social media. So for example, Slate.com, when it comes from social media, about 20, the, 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 po the political interest of the readers that they get from social media is much higher than the political interest of the readers they get from direct navigation, which is saying that, when, that the, so their, their audience from social media is more politically interested than their audience from direct navigation. But it can flip, across, some outlets flip in different directions. So for example, Fox News gets, in terms of Huffington Post readers, so kind of liberal readers, Fox News sees many more liberal readers from social media than it does from direct navigation, for example. And I should also mention, all the numbers I'm going to show you today are a bit preliminary because we, we had a pilot crowdsource and then we've ex we expanded the crowdsourcing, and not all of the final crowdsourcing data is in yet. So any magnitude I show you could change, but the things have been qualitatively robust. So what I want to do now, and what we spend a lot of time in our paper, is decompositions. So decompositions, basically, and there's a couple of ways to do this. We have a way that graphically, which I think is kind of fun to look at. So let me just show you what we do. So right here, this is all users. And this is, we're going to look at only articles that are potentially politically polarized. Um, and so what I'm going to show in, in each of these charts is three bars. So these, the, the red bars are direct navigation. So this is the share of direct navigation that is on liberal articles, neutral articles, and conservative articles across all outlets. And this is the share on, on social media. And so if the, compare the red bar and the blue bar, we see that um, direct navigation is more neutral and social media is more polarized on aggregate. The green bars are sort of a counterfactual that's, that's attempting to sort of capture the idea of, uh, in, a, in a visual way of what happened, what, how much of this is due to differences in composition. So the green bars are constructed by taking the direct navigation page views and reweighting them, in this case, so that they have the same topic mix as the social media. So it's what would these numbers be if the topics mix of direct navigation was the same as the topic mix of social media? And so the idea is that if the green bar was the same as the blue bar, then we would say that all of the raw differences are due to differences in topic mix. And so what we see is that these re-weightings in general are going to kind of narrow the gap but not completely close the gap. So it says that part of the difference, part of the reason that people are doing more neutral stuff on direct navigation than social media is they're reading different topics on social media than they are on direct navigation. And if you just adjust for the topic mix, you're going to see something more similar. Okay. Now we go to the user decomposition. So this is the, what you're asking earlier, Jesse. So what if I take the same users and I'm going to reweight my users such that the user mix on direct navigation is the same as the user mix on social media. And we see that in terms of the overall numbers, that really closes a lot of the gap. So in aggregate, most of the difference between the biasness of the consumption is due to user mix rather than, um, rather than a, a difference in what different users do. 
But of course, if you run various regressions and look at various attributes, you will find that users do behave differently. I'm not saying that that's not there or not important, but it's just not the main, it's not the only thing. And it doesn't, it doesn't, and the user explains a lot of the aggregate variation. Now over here, we, which I, I, I didn't, haven't talked about yet, we, we do the same exercise, but we only look at conservative users. And so they're conservative, we, get, we score all the articles, and so they're conservative if sort of minus one for liberal, zero for neutral, one for conservative, if the average score is negative. Now these are kind of noisy measures, so this is something where we probably will improve, and if we were writing only about this topic, we would probably spend even more effort on this, because we don't, you know, we still, even, we've crowdsourced a lot of articles, but we still, you know, it's still pretty noisy. Most people don't have a lot of articles that are coded as politically polarized, and so these, these samples are a bit small. But what we see is that among conservative users, they are, they are reading almost no liberal news. They are reading much more polarized news on, um, on social media. But interestingly, the different, for the conservative users, we're finding that the user decomposition actually uh, closes a lot of the gap between direct navigation and social media. The liberal users, we see the liberal users are mainly reading liberal stuff through social media. Um, they're hardly reading con any conservative stuff at all through social media. Um, or, or direct navigation for that matter, but the, the social media is even more skewed. So basically, like if you're liberal and you're going to go from social media, it's really going to be stuff that's in your affinity. Okay. So just to give you like a tiny taste of what a lot of the rest of the project is about, I'm show, I'll show you some other um, characteristics which are also a little bit related to political informativeness. So here's two different characteristics. One is um, the individual, whether the article gives an individual perspective or it's straight news. So we give some examples of whether like you're reporting about a tornado from the perspective of a family that was affected, which is a more in-depth research kind of article, where straight news is like there was a tornado. Over here we have whether the tone was caring and supportive, neutral, or critical and cynical. And in both of these attributes, we see pretty big differences due to social media and the, the user mix adjustment accounts for some of the gap. Just let me give you a few more facts about polarization that I thought were kind of interesting for the discussion. Um, one is that the topic is a lot more important than the outlet in terms of determining the bias. And there's lots of ways you can measure this. I did something like super simple where you, you run a regression of whether the article is potentially biased or not. Um, here we have a sample of about 20,000 articles from the largest 14 outlets. And we try to see whether outlet dummies, topic dummies, or the combination um, do a better job predicting whether the outlet is potentially biased. We find that the outlet dummies are not jointly significant in that regression, um, and you get a ton of action, almost all the action, out of the topic dummies. And so this is just for the largest outlets. Of course, if you go down to the, the, the mid and the tail of outlets, there's certainly a certain outlets that are very predictive of being polarized. But if you want to cover like the mass of, it, of things, it's really that like different outlets cover different topics. Um, and that's, that's a big part of what's going on and how politically polarized their viewing is. So we looked also at, at articles that are actually biased, um, and we also found the same results, that, that basically the, the topic predicts whether they're actually biased rather than the outlet. So, he, so here's the broad, these are the broad, this is the set of broad types. And so we have about 200 subtypes, which we've clustered into broad topics. And so this is like a little heat map, and there's a, there's a lot of information on here, but here's the is political bias possible by broad topic, and we see that you know, government programs, legislature, scandals, terrorism and terrorist incidents and war are all things where all of the subtopics were potentially politically polarized. And then if we see the share of articles that are actually biased, um, you know, that matches up. So almost all of the terrorism articles were actually biased. And then if the, those terrorism articles, um, were generally a little more liberal, um, and then the government programs were a little more conservative. And we can see that, you know, also sports is a really big deal to get rid of. Um, in, some, in some sense, maybe we should just throw them all out, although we did have some of these, of these gay rights articles in there that are a little bit interesting. But the fact that like 85% of my Fox page views were from sports, you know, kind of says I have to be really careful about how I, how I do this. Um, okay, and, and also people like hammer the websites for sports. Um, so here's, here's another, um, I'm almost done. Our outlets are also very heterogeneous in terms of covering various p potentially biased topics. So this is a set of, of um, outlets. And so like for example, is political bias possible? 
So surprisingly, like Bloomberg and Business Week have pretty high scores for that because they're covering various political things that, uh, like you know, government programs or things like that. Um, and then another thing like subject motiv motivates voting in the national election, like CNN apparently covered a lot of those topics in our sample. We also have these things like was the article, if you shared the article, would it have been shared to provoke debate? Would it have been shared to support a cause? So we see a lot of heterogeneity there as well. So just to, to finish up, we've spent a lot of time trying to measure and describe how news consumption differs across social media and direct navigation. We have some interesting ways to try to categorize that. Um, we have some initial findings about political bias. Um, I would say, so what, what we're doing going forward then is trying to find other sort of machine learning and uh, techniques to try to summer, to take all of our big descriptors of like, you know, 50 variables about each article and summarize them in, in, a, more, um, in a more parsimonious way to really, uh, to really help understand the, the, what social media does from both the uh, user side and from the outlet response side. And so we're very, very open to suggestions. Obviously, we have this massive data set. Any one of these individual topics could, could, could really use a lot more thinking. All right, so um, thanks very much for organizing the conference and for organizing this panel. The title of the talk is, Are Social Media More Social Than Media? And this is joint work with uh, Josh Halberstam, who is in the audience here. Um, let me give you a little bit of introduction and motivation. It, it's probably a little bit relevant, uh, less relevant for this audience, but I think it's important nonetheless. Uh, needless to say, access to information and freedom of expression is a significant policy issue around the world. And I think it's also clear that in democracies, there's a presumption that citizens should have access to as much information as possible. And further, there's often a, an argument put forward for pluralism, and in particular, that multiple information sources may be more valuable when they come from diverse viewpoints. And the, the argument here is that if you, if you hear everything uh, that's from a like-minded viewpoint, those views may be correlated and provide less information on the margin. Okay, so what is social media? Um, the, the, the dictionary definition is a form of electronic communication through which users uh, create online communities to share information, ideas, uh, personal messages and other content. Um, this, again, should come as no surprise to many of you in the audience, but this new media has spread rapidly. Uh, according to a recent survey, 60% of American adults uh, are, are using social media. And among this group, um, two-thirds report that they've engaged in some form of civic or political activity using social media. And uh, another survey suggests uh, that over 20% of registered voters uh, use social media to let others know how they voted in, in 2012. Okay, so I think it's important from a conceptual viewpoint to think about how social media are different. And here I want to emphasize three points. Um, the first is that unlike traditional media outlets, typical users can both uh, produce and consume information. So if I think about a traditional media outlet uh, or a traditional news program like CBS Evening News, um, there's a clear vertical relationship in the sense that CBS Evening News is producing the information. Uh, I'm home on my sofa watching TV and I'm consuming information. Uh, on, on social media, by contrast, if I'm on Twitter, I can produce information via tweets. Uh, I can also share information from other users, uh, but at the same time, I'm a consumer of information. Um, similarly, unlike traditional media outlets, uh, content depends upon self-chosen links uh, and so again, going back to the CBS Evening News example, if there's a conservative and a liberal both watching CBS Evening News, uh, they're seeing the same content. Um, people, two different users on Twitter may experience very different content depending upon uh, what, what they choose to follow. Uh, no, of course, people could choose to watch different uh, television news programs as well, so um, th there is that, uh, that issue as well. Um, and then finally, this is going to be a little less relevant for the, the results I'm going to show you today. It's a little more relevant for the, the thing that we're working on next, which is that um, if we compare this to, say, social media to traditional face-to-face uh, -face social interactions, I think it's clear that information is going to travel uh, more rapidly and broadly. And so this is due to the fact that users can retweet uh, other users' information. And so uh, information tra travels quickly. Okay, so how might uh, social media uh, contribute to ideological segregation, and how might it change the, the equilibrium in terms of ideological segregation? 
Uh, on the one hand, uh, and I think everything I'm going to say here is probably true for the advent of the internet as well, uh, and other forms of media outlets as well. But you know, I think the, what we want to emphasize is that, on the one hand, social media could expose individuals to a more diverse uh, set of viewpoints if they can reach uh, beyond their traditional geographic domain. So if I grew up in Texas and I want to be exposed to liberal content, I could potentially use social media to do that. On the other hand, in the, in the network, uh, in, in the literature on networks, there's kind of this well-known uh, fact that, uh, that has become known as homophily. So homophily refers to the fact that there's a tendency of individuals to link to like-minded individuals. And so um, this is very easy to do in the context of social media, and that could lead to more segregation. So in this paper, we're going to examine the degree of ideological homophily and uh, segregation uh, on, on the social network Twitter. OK, um, I'm not going to, given the time constraints, I'm not going to spend too much time on the literature. Um, there's a, this paper kind of is related to a literature on homophily and networks. Uh, there's, there's a literature by, uh, politi uh, by computer scientists on political communication on Twitter. Uh, we're going to be doing something a little bit different in the sense that in this paper we're not going to be focused explicitly on content and communication, but we're going to be focused on the, the structure of the network. Uh, and needless to say, many people in this room have, have worked on uh, research in the area of media and politics. And then um, finally, there's this uh, other literature on ideological uh, segregation on the internet. And so Matt and Jesse have this paper. Uh, that, that looks at the role of the internet in terms of its contribution to ideological segregation. And this is kind of the key finding from their paper, which is that the internet is, is maybe uh, less segregated than conventional wisdom might suggest, in the sense that it's you know, closer to other types of traditional media outlets like uh, newspapers, and it's less extreme than other types of traditional social interactions, such as uh, interactions with family, uh, people you trust, and political discussions. So I'll come back to this uh, figure uh, later in the paper. OK, just to give you, uh, you've probably all seen Twitter. This is my co-author Yosha's uh, Twitter interface. I'm, I'm embarrassed to show uh, my own because I only follow Britney Spears. Uh, but so uh, just to show you how this works, for those of you who don't know Twitter, uh, in the upper left panel is where you're going to, uh, you can produce your information via tweets. And then in the right panel is where you're going to consume information via uh, the tweets of accounts that you've chosen to follow. OK, um, so let me tell you a little bit about the data that we've put together for this project. So our goal is to construct a network of politically engaged Twitter users. There's a lot of different ways that you could do this. Um, but given this goal, and also, of course, on Twitter, there's no direct measure of voter ideology or user ideology. Um, so, so the way that we address this is to, we've, and we, it's also Twitter is just so big, we need to narrow things a little bit. So what we do is we focus on Twitter users who follow politicians. And for the purpose of what I'm going to show you today, we've defined politicians as candidates uh, for the US House in 2012. Uh, there's also results in the paper for the Senate. And this yields roughly 2.2 million users, what we're going to refer to as voters. Uh, I use the word voters loosely here in the sense that, of, of course, not all of these uh, accounts are, are going to be associated with voters. Uh, we then download information on the followers of voters, and then we can construct the, the link between these different voters. So this yields roughly uh, 90 million links between these different uh, voters. And then finally, we're going to use the, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to use the politicians that they follow to, uh, to try to infer the ideology of the users. So in particular, we're going to define a voter as conservative if they follow more Republican candidates than Democratic candidates, and liberal if they follow more Democrats than Republicans. Um, we throw out a, about 5% of the sample that, that follows an equal number. OK, so this just gives you a graphical overview of what I just said. Uh, we start with these candidate accounts. This is how we define the sample. Uh, we then find users who follow at least one uh, candidate account. Uh, we then construct the links between these different voters uh, using information on the, the followers, uh, which, which voters follow other voters. And then finally, we infer the ideology of these users uh, by looking back up in terms of which candidates they follow. So if you follow more Democrats than Republican, we're going to code you as liberal and otherwise conservative. OK, just to give you some sense of, of kind of an, the, so, some 
external information, it's not outside of Twitter, but at least within Twitter, uh, on kind of the validity of these ideological measures. In this graph, in this figure, uh, what, we've, what we've done is we've also downloaded information on who follows uh, a sample of media outlets or personalities associated with different media outlets or shows associated with media outlets. So these are, uh, these are roughly speaking traditional media outlets. And the y-axis here is the, the likelihood that a liberal follows this outlet uh, relative to a conservative in our, in our sample of voters. And so you can see, uh, if you look at MSNBC, um, a liberal is three times more likely to follow MSNBC than a conservative. Uh, and if you look at Fox News, by contrast, you get the, the reverse, that a liberal is less likely because the, the likelihood ratio is less than one, uh, a liberal is gonna be less likely to follow uh, Fox News than a conservative. Okay, um, so what we're gonna do in this paper is try to measure both ideological homophily and ideological segregation. So uh, following this paper by Matt Jackson and colleagues, we're gonna define the homophily index. So this is gonna be defined separately for conservatives and liberals. We've only got two groups here and it's, gonna, it's a very simple measure. It's gonna be the share of the same type uh, voters that you follow. So if you're a conservative, we're gonna compute the fraction of those that you follow that are also conservative. And if you're liberal, we're gonna compute the fraction of liberals. Uh, in this literature, there are these kind of well-defined measures. Um, let WT denote the share of group T in the network. So for now, we'll just think about this as Twitter as a whole. Um, WT is just gonna be the fraction of, of voters in our sample uh, that are either conservative or liberal. Uh, the network satisfies relative homophily. This just means that uh, bigger groups, larger groups, we only have two groups, uh, we're gonna find that there's more conservatives in our sample than liberals. So relative homophily will be satisfied if conservatives uh, have a higher degree of homophily than, than liberals. Uh, inbreeding homophily just means that your uh, homophily index is higher than your share in the population. Um, if it's less, that's referred to as heterophily. And two and three are motivated by the idea that under random matching, uh, you're gonna get that homophily is gonna be exactly equal to the, to the share in the population. So deviations from random matching uh, are gonna be characterized as either inbreeding homophily or heterophily. Okay, so this shows, um, again, from a national perspective, uh, or taking Twitter as a whole, uh, what does homophily look like? So as I said in our sample about 30, we have more, uh, more people follow uh, Republicans than Democrats. And so in our sample, 64% uh, of users are coded as conservative, 36% is liberal. If we look at liberals, they follow uh, about 58 or 59 other uh, voters on in a typical account. Um, 40 of those happen to be uh, liberals, and so the homophily index for liberals is 69%. Uh, for conservatives, they follow uh, 68 voters on average, 58 of whom are also conservative, so uh, homophily index for conservatives is 84%. So, um, as you can see, um, both of these groups are inbreeding in the sense that their homophily index is bigger than their population share, and relative homophily is also satisfied uh, just in the simple calculation uh, because conservatives have a higher homophily index than liberals. Um, we, we also want to use some of the variation, and so what we're going to try to do next is create some subnetworks. Um, we've gone back and forth about whether we should do this based on uh, I mean, the natural way to think about this is in terms of geography. Uh, we have a measure of candidate geography where the candidate is located. We also have some rough measures of voter geography. Those are in the paper. I'm not gonna talk about those today. Um, candidate geography, uh, so we're gonna, what I'm gonna show you next is gonna use candidate geography, either the state in which the candidate is located or the congressional district uh, to create subnetworks. And these subnetworks are gonna allow us to test for three features of friendship networks that were documented in this paper by Matt Jackson that looked at friendship networks in high schools. And so the, the key findings in this paper, and this has been found in other uh, studies of networks as well, uh, is that homophily is larger for bigger groups, that is relative homophily is satisfied, uh, groups inbreed, and uh, larger groups have more links per capita. Okay, so the, the let me just show you the, okay, so first of all, I'm gonna focus on these first two predictions, uh, homophily, relative homophily and, and inbreeding. And so what this, what this graph shows, this is uh, looking at state level networks, so we're just um, defining a network as the 
based upon the candidates in a given state and looking at who follows them and then constructing a network in that way. So each dot here is a state uh, and then a, a group, whether it's liberal or conservative. So the, the key takeaways from this is that relative homophily is satisfied in the sense that this is upward sloping. Uh, and I should tell you what, this, uh, what these axes are. Uh, the the x-axis is the share of the group in the population. The y-axis is the homophily index. And the, the line there is the 45 degree line. And so um, there tends to be an upward sloping relationship. So relative homophily is satisfied. Um, and then the, if they fall above the 45 degree line, this is uh, what's known as inbreeding. And you can see that's satisfied for every group except two. At the congressional district level, we see uh, a, a very similar pattern. There's obviously uh, a lot of noise when you go down to the congressional district level, however. Um, and then finally, we look at this um, prediction that larger groups have more links per capita. So if you're in a network with, with more of your same types and you have preferences for linking to like-minded users, you're going to have more links uh, the larger is your group. And that's exactly what we see here. Again, the x-axis is the share of that group in the state, and the y-axis is the, um, the number of voters followed on a per capita basis, per user. And so you can, again, see this upward sloping relationship at both the state level. Um, again, there's a little bit, there's more noise at the district level, but you also see an upward sloping relationship. Turning to uh, our measures of ideological segregation, I'm going to go through this relatively quickly. We're just following the, uh, the, the measures, the standard measures of ideological segregation. I think it is useful to go through this to think about how you could extend this to, to more of a network structure. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to define, uh, for each voter account J, uh, we're going to define the share conservative as the share of followers of that voter account J who are conservative. And then uh, this gets a little confusing with the, the J's and the I's. But then for each voter I, we're going to look at the set of accounts that they follow, and we're going to compute the average share conservative across those accounts. And then conservative exposure at the group level, of course, is just going to be the average conservative exposure across all voters I of type T. And then isolation is just going to be the difference in conservative exposure for conservatives when compared to liberals. And so this is placing um, our measure on this, on this graph um, taken uh, from, from Matt and Jesse's numbers. And so the key takeaway here is that the Twitter network is, is highly segregated. So we get a segregation an isolation index of about 0.4, which is much more in line with these types of uh, social interactions than with traditional media outlets. Uh, I'm going to just jump ahead. I think this is the most important, uh, the, the, the final most important thing that I want to say, uh, which is to, to think about a couple of sample selection issues. So obviously, we, um, the way that we've constructed the sample might uh, lead to uh, concerns about sample selection issues. And so I think there's two selection issues that I want to talk about. First of all, uh, Twitter users are not representative of voters at large. I think this is, uh, th this is, this is certainly well known. I mean, Twitter users are younger, uh, more highly educated. They're uh, less white. Uh, and so I, I think we're going we're gonna to certainly accept this as, as fact. Um, nonetheless, you know, social media are an important sector to study. And more importantly, I think it's important to place social media uh, relative to other types of media outlets and, and social interactions. The second one, I think, is, is more problematic in the sense that, you know, when, we, when we're placing, um, you know, when we're trying to compare our numbers to other studies, I think we have to account for the fact that Twitter users who follow candidates may not be representative of Twitter users at large. So it's natural to think that um, Twitter users who follow candidates are going to be more ideologically extreme. They're probably also going to have stronger preferences for linking to like-minded users. So we attempt to address this selection issue in a, in a couple of ways. The first is that we, we ignore the links between voters. We keep our sample of voters. We ignore the links. But what we then do is we look at segregation in terms of the media outlets that they follow on, on Twitter using the, some of the ones that I showed you earlier. Uh, and then secondly, we're going to focus on a subsample of our, of, our, um, of our network, what we call moderate voters, and those are going to be those who follow candidates from both parties. So when we exclude the, 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 the ones that only follow one party, um, the idea is we're getting rid of some of those extremists. And then we're going to combine these two. OK, so when we, when we look at segregation in media outlets for these Twitter users, so again, just to be clear, this is not using any information on the links between voters. We're just keeping the sample of voters and looking at the media outlets that they follow. Uh, 
And there you find that segregation uh, falls significantly. It's, um, it's, it's about 0.24 now. And so it's still higher than the, uh, you know, the, I think the most comparable number would be um, the, the news consumption on the internet from, from Matt and Jesse's paper. So now we find something that's kind of in between our, our political network on Twitter and this, um, this low measure of ideological segregation on the internet. Um, when we look at just Twitter moderates, when we throw out the extremists, again, not surprisingly, we, fall that, uh, we find that segregation falls. Uh, it's, it's closer to 0.2 now, so it uh, drops almost in half uh, relative to the overall network. And then the final thing that we do, which I think the, the thing that we want to emphasize, is we then look at the consumption of, these, um, of, of media outlets for these moderate users. And here we find something that kind of allows us to, to make our results perhaps more comparable uh, to, to the existing literature. Yeah, so this is just um, segregation in, the, in terms of what media outlets they follow, but just looking at these uh, moderates. And so here you can see we find something that's, that's quite in line with, uh, with, with Matt and Jesse's study of the internet. And so, you know, if you want to, if you want to have something that's maybe more comparable, you could, uh, you know, you could look at these Twitter moderates in terms of their media consumption, you find something uh, much more in line. And then when you look at the, the, the network structure for these Twitter moderates, uh, you find something that's um, bigger but, but much smaller than, than our baseline numbers. Okay, so uh, in summary, patterns of homophily in social media are similar to those found in face-to-face -face social networks. Uh, and I think, it's, I think it's important to distinguish, you know, another way to think about the difference between media consumption on Twitter and the, the network structure on Twitter is thinking about how people use Twitter. So in particular, when Twitter is used as a social network, I think we can argue that um, it's highly segregated along ideological lines, placing it on par with other face-to-face -face social interactions. Uh, when Twitter is used to follow media outlets, by contrast, we find that uh, segregation is significantly lower. And I think it's clear that people use Twitter or social media in general um, you know, for both of these things. And there's, really, there's also a mix between these things in the sense that users that you follow are gonna share uh, media outlet uh, exposure with you as well. Um, finally, I just want to say where we're going uh, in a companion study. Um, we, we don't have anything in this, in this current paper on, on content, but so what we've also downloaded is candidate tweets, um, the, 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 the information produced by these candidates during the 2012 election, and we're planning to look at how this, um, flow, how this information throws, flows through the Twitter political network both in terms of how long it takes uh, this information to reach different users and whether it reaches them at all. So thinking about the retweet network and whether that increases uh, segregation further potentially. And I will stop there. Okay. All right, so um, interestingly, a lot of the, the sort of numbers in this, this, these slides will relate back to the numbers we saw earlier. Hopefully, we'll tie it all together in kind of a consistent story. Um, and luckily, I think we're converging on, on some consistent answers. So when I grew up, this is the choice, this was sort of the newspaper landscape in the country. I grew up in Houston, and we had the Houston Chronicle. By the time I could read, basically the Houston Post had died. Um, and so I think when you were growing up, if you grew up when I grew up, you basically were in a world where you had one home delivery outlet. You probably grew up in the suburbs, so you couldn't really walk and get a paper, and this was your options. And I think this, in some sense, forms the kind of baseline for comparison of online consumption, to offline consumption in Jesse and Matt's paper. And so this is sort of the world we started in. And then we're going to like, <clears throat> this is a picture of, of the internet, if you search the internet. Um, and the question every paper today is dealt with is how does that change the information people are exposed to? And that's the question I'm gonna be grappling with too. One of the interesting things that, you know, I came across in the course of thinking about this is that this baseline wasn't the world 50 years ago or 60 years ago. So there's an enormous decline in daily newspapers from like World War II at its peak, or in the 1930s at its peak, to the 1980s, okay? And so basically most cities had five to 10 newspapers, and they, if you, no one's done the text, 1910s, sure. But no, uh, no one's done, to my knowledge, the classification, say the congressional style classification of these papers, but if you read what communication scholars write about it, they say there was the liberal, the very liberal. In fact, in the 1910s, they even have like voice of the Republican Party on the, the banner. So um, since 
you know, back at the turn of the last century, we went from a period of, of sort of great choice buying newspapers on the street with lots of, lots of outlet choice, and there's, there's sort of, at least if you believe the communication scholars, there's dispersion and horizontally, to you know, this picture when I grew up where one paper per city to a first order had survived, and then you have the internet. So this is not the first time, and you know, one of the reasons those papers died was suburbanization, one of the reasons those papers died was radio, one of the reasons papers died was TV, and one of the reasons newspapers are dying right now is, is the internet. So, you know, print media is, has a long history of competing with other forms of media. I guess they have a long history of losing that competition in some sense, but um, this has happened before. It'd be interesting to study. Um, so everyone so far has introduced it for me. So, you know, when we talk about the changing landscape of news consumption, we're talking about fundamentally in some sense increased choice, Houston Chronicle to the internet. Uh, the way I can access information, homophily and sharing patterns might change the information I'm exposed to and what I can access. And then one of the concerns we haven't heard raised but is underlying all this is this idea of algorithmic personalization, which creates a feedback loop between, say, initial choice patterns and then the choice sets you see in the future. Um, and it might create a feedback loop between initial sort of homophily distribution and choice sets you see in the future, okay? So, in fact, in the lay press, algorithmic personalization has gotten a lot of attention, and the term that's often applied to it is the filter bubble. You might want to access a lot of information, but based on this machine learned feedback loop, the choice sets you get start looking more and ho more homogenous. You fail to realize that, and so you're sort of in this bubble, but one created by an algorithmically designed filter. Um, the more classic, I guess it's not showing up, idea of that is an echo chamber where this could happen for, without that step, this could happen for psychological reasons, and we've seen in lab studies this can happen for reasons without that feedback loop, but that feedback loop in some sense would, would exacerbate it. Okay, so that we're going to look at the importance of these uh, factors in, in the empirical data. We're using almost the same time period and almost the same data as Susan used. We don't have to get too deep into that. Um, our time period, March to May 2013, and we start with you know, a large number of page views. And in this, everything I'll tell you will be on a subset of users from about a million users to 50,000 users that are somewhat active looking at the news. Um, about one in five Americans say they read the news online actively. We're getting a lower number, but that 1.2 million, we, a lot of those are really light usage. You, know, you, you install this toolbar on a, one browser you use, but you don't use that browser that frequently. So it's hard to take this number that seriously, but it's something to keep in mind that every statement I make will be about a subset of people that seem like they consume the news online. That might be the subset you care about, but it's interesting that even in surveys and in our data too, a lot of people just don't do that. They just, they just go to YouTube um, to a first order. Um, okay, I'll skip that. So we're gonna try to generate a corpus, a news corpus, and we'll do this in a way that is similar to the way Susan did it, but uh, differs in some important ways. So we'll take news domains listed on a crowdsourced human annotated platform called the Open Directory Product, uh, Project, which you've, you've probably seen used before. That gives 45,000 news outlets. We'll take the URLs from browsing events on those domains. We'll get the article text by scraping them, and we'll take advantage of the fact that every sort of decent news outlet uses static URL, so that article can get page rank and get higher search ranking in the future, so it just sits there. Um, we'll classify the articles based on the text. Um, we'll using supervised machine learning, and in everything I'll talk about, we'll limit to the top 100 domains. It covers 98% of consumption. One of the reasons we do this is that for these 100 domains, that we have an informative prior, and there's actually past work on the ideological stance of the outlet. Outside of that, it's hard, and uh, it, it's also only 2% of consumption. Okay, so here's what we do. I'll try to describe it as simply as possible. We take all viewed web pages. We restrict the articles on news websites. Um, in this corpus we're looking at, that's 800,000 unique articles, so 800,000 unique pieces of information. Um, we're gonna try to classify this into what we consider front section news, national world news, stuff that would show up in the first section of the New York Times or the Washington Post. So stuff that's in that part of the paper, we're gonna consider news, it might have a political content. Stuff that's in the sports and weather and entertainment section, we're not gonna be interested in, we're gonna try to eliminate that from the corpus. It probably doesn't reflect the ideological stance of the outlet. And from that stuff that's front section news, we're gonna try to separate out descriptive reporting from opinion articles, okay? And like I said, we're gonna do this each time with a with supervised learning. Um, and the percentages I'm showing you here are not weighted by readership, but they're not, they're not far off. Um, so what you can see here is that the majority of stuff is what we consider non-news. The majority of, of 
unique articles, in fact, even more of consumption, because as mentioned, sports and stuff is disproportionately consumed. So here's how we uh, do the supervised step. For 21 of the top 100 domains, they use a stable classification system that uh, in the URLs. So USA Today will tag a story about Obamacare with politics in the URL and a story about a celebrity wedding with life in the URL. And of our top 100 domains, 21 use this stable classification structure. Okay? So we'll use these as our labels. The label, a positive example will be something that says politics, something like that in the label. And a negative example is this life or sports or weather. Um, and we'll use the, then we'll use, so that sort of labeled true hits as politics and, and true misses as these life and entertainment. And then we'll try, to, we'll ex use the machine learning to extend these classifications to the whole corpus. And importantly, we'll use the predicted labels, even for our 21 out of 100, we'll use the predicted labels for those guys too, just so we don't get any bias in the uh, sort of uh, this classification. Okay, uh, this approach led to a 96% accuracy on a holdout sample, so trying to predict for those 21 outlets, we had 96% accuracy and 88% accuracy on hand-labeled uh, from Mechanical Turk. So if you ask people to do it, we get 88% accuracy, accuracy. So we can cover an enormous amount of the news people are consuming through this supervised way. To a first order, we're getting, we're getting it right. Um, and for the descriptive news to opinion step, We've validated this with a NLP researchers have looked at the subjectivity of words and frequency of personal pronouns indicating opinion, and it's highly correlated with their measures as well. Okay, so it's showing up as what other people have said constitutes opinion. It's showing up there. And for separating out front section news from other stuff, the words you think show up show up. It's words that are associated with politics, not sports, and so forth. Insofar as there's an intersection there, we might, we might miss something. That probably constitute that 12% accuracy miss. Okay, so before we get to the results, we're, we're going to use the, you know, there's at least a few popular ways to peg an outlet's stance. Brian just talked about th this way, and we'll be using this way too. It's trying to estimate the conservative share of their readership. Um, we went with this to make our results directly comparable to Jesse and Matt's. In, uh, we didn't have complete overlap in our top 100, but we could use just the scores from your paper for like the 41. We do have overlap, and all the results that I'm going to show you wouldn't change. So... Um, this isn't a, a way the results would break or differ. Um, we inferred a conservative share with county level voting. You can look at the paper. Um, it's not perfect, but it gives you something highly correlated with what they get from the surveys that people actually filled out before they visited websites. Um, so things that, you know, we say have low conservative share, consistent with their survey evidence, of, and things that we say have high conservative share, consistent with their survey evidence. Um, but because we're using fitted values, the numbers aren't directly comparable. So if I come up with 0.11 and they come up with 0.07, I don't want to make a big deal out of that difference necessarily. Um, anyway, that's not a, that big a difference to begin with. Okay, so here's the rest of the talk. We'll talk about these measures. User polarity is a measure of a user's mean consumption. So it's saying something about the mean. Segregation is saying something about the distance between two randomly selected users' means. So it's a statement, again, about means, but across users. And then separately, we'll look at within user breadth of exposure, but note these two first things don't directly capture that. Okay? So you could be a, have a segregated population, but with a large overlap in consumption, because segregation is about the means by this definition. Okay, as a baseline, this is the distribution across all consumption of user polarity, and the segregation is 0.11. That's about the distance between ABC News and Fox News, or similarly, a centrist outlet and the New York Times. And I think we just saw a graph with their study, it was 0.07. Uh, and like I said, if we use just their holdout sample, we get a similar number. The difference could be due to the fact that we filtered out sports and weather. The difference could be due to the fact that it's a different time period, and the difference could be due to the fact that we're using different numbers. So I, I, I don't want to make a big deal out of this. Also, it's quite close to the number they pulled out. So in some sense, that study is holding up. In a, in a very real sense, that study is holding up very well. Um, I'll skip an inch of time. I'll have eight minutes. I want to just get to the results. I'll skip how we did this. As Susan mentioned, this is an equilibrium outcome. So what I'm showing you here is the equilibrium outcome of both what the uh, people do on social media, what the outlets provide, and how people choose things. So everything you're looking at here is some part of some big endogenous system. So if I use the word like search impacts segregation, translate that in your head to correlation. I'll try to be very careful. It's obviously, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of things going on. But what I'm showing you here is the segregation by channel and by opinion and, and news outlet. So what I'm saying here is every dot 
if I pick two randomly selecting users doing direct navigation, for instance, consuming descriptive news, the segregation is 0.11. Those two randomly selected users, the segregation between them if they're consuming opinion via, via direct navigation is slightly higher, 0.13, okay? So what you're seeing here as we go from aggregator, aggregator I wouldn't take too seriously. Very, very few people use aggregators and a lot of these other channels. They look like different people and it's not a, not a very popular way to consume, at least in our sample and the page, uh, the ranking, uh, popularity ranking of Google News would confirm that. Um, so what's going on here? If you looked at, throwing over the aggregator line, aggregator dot, which is a really small percentage of consumption, here is how much, uh, relative frequency consumption. Direct navigation dominates the landscape, okay? Aggregator is almost negligible, search is second, and social media is third, okay? But direct navigation is dominating the landscape, and of every 100 news stories we have, 94 are in that dark line. So if you just estimated this, if you just looked at this graph, and we didn't separate out the, the sort of subjectivity of the article, you would basically see there's no big difference between direct navigation, social, and search. Those differences, although statistically significant from a sampling point of view, probably not from a model point of view, right? So we wouldn't take those differences that seriously. The differences only show up for the 6% of news or 3% or of consumption overall, 2% of consumption overall, uh, that's in that opinion line. And there you do see this large difference. So the first order of fact is that for descriptive reporting, we're not seeing a substantial difference, and we would have missed that had we not separated this out. Um, now, the, when you look at lab studies on choice, these numbers say 0.2 compared to, uh, on search for opinion, compared to point for direct navigation, 0.17, that's a, or sorry, 0.14, that's a big difference, but it's actually a lot smaller than you would have predicted from reading your favorite psychology study on the topic. You would have predicted there that it would have been like an enormous, once I take you out of the direct navigation world and give you all these choices, you overwhelmingly choose stuff that agrees with your prior. And um, what was going on there is that for every, 100 lab studies and article choice, they all study opinion, and they all study opinion of a particular variety, which is abortion, death penalty, and gun rights. Those three topics control almost everything you read on that, in that literature, and those happen to be opinion, so we expect the dynamics to at play. We actually might not have any prediction over the news line at all, because uh, we've never actually had lab studies just reading like a boring news story or, or a breaking news story. And even within that opinion line, the vast majority of the stuff is not something I think you have as meaningful a prior on as the death penalty, abortion, and gun rights. So those huge differences predicted, I think, were somewhat a function of the fact that those are the most interesting things to study in the lab, but they also the things that people had the most polarizing priors on. What's generating the equilibrium difference between these two lines? In search, we know all these things matter. Query formulation matters. You use a different sort of language if you are from a conservative area than from a liberal area to describe the same topic. You might do that because that's the vernacular. You might do that because that's what you want, but you do. And that's been demonstrated in the computer science literature. Uh, there might be differential ranking based on some sort of personalization. You have the fundamental aspect of choice. You have now a choice set versus just direct navigation. And there's a topic mix issue. On social media, there's that algorithm personalization. There's your friend sharing patterns. And again, there's their choice. Uh, direct navigation, there's even something good direct navigation. So here is uh, the front page of various outlets. And I'm showing you here, of the 10 articles on the front page, or the top 10 articles uh, they promote, what number are political or, slant or political or opinion. And Daily Cost and Breitbart, it's like five or six. New York Times and Fox News, it's three or four. And the centrist outlets like USA Today and Huffington po uh, USA Today and CNN and so forth are like one. So even the direct navigation, if I just directly navigate to two sites, I'm more likely to get an opinion difference. So I wouldn't, it's tempting to attribute to say, one, people consume opinion, they themselves actively choose more polarizing outlets. When you consume, when you go to a more polarizing outlet, they are, they're promoting opinion more. It's demonstrated there, and Susan discussed that as well. That's what I mean that these facts are kind of sliding together nicely. Um, but why is this dot for social media so small? If you read like a book by Cass Sunstein, you'd expect that to be revolutionizing the news industry. And it doesn't seem to be. It seems to be direct navigation, despite these brand new channels and it's so fun, most people consume the majority of their news by typing in NY Times and then clicking around. Okay, it's like 70-80%. So why is that the case? Why, why, why hasn't social media revolutionized how we consume news? It's fun to use, we all know that. Um, well, we looked at all the outbound clicks from Facebook, not just the news sites. Only one in 300 clicked links relate to a news article um, in our sample. We have 98% of news articles, okay? So 98, we have 98% of news consumption. 
So one in 300, 150 go to YouTube. The rest, you can explain the rest of them, all, all, the vast majority by Instagram, BuzzFeed, and Reddit, okay? So the vast majority of links from social media are going to things that are kind of fun, and I think it has revolutionized photo sharing. It fundamentally has. But it hasn't revolutionized the news, potentially, because only one in 300 social links relate to news in our sample. That's not even opinion. For opinion, it's about one in 1,000, okay? So when you think of something people are doing on Facebook, 999 times they're doing something that's not an opinion article when they're clicking a link. So now, of course, if they're looking at it and reading it, that's, that's a different story. We're missing that. We're only seeing clicks, but I think to a first we're capturing something real here. I was just talking about means, statements about means, but it could be the case that social media and search have two effects. One, they could sort of push our means further apart, but they could increase the breadth of our distribution. It's natural. There are bigger choice sets. So we'll define uh, opposing partisan exposure. So we'll just say, if you're a left-wing user, if the mean thing you read is left wing, how much of what you read comes from the right third? And if you're a mean right wing user, how much of what you read comes from the left third? Similar to what Brian just defined. Um, it's only defined for a subset of people that are in those wings. So here, as we go towards zero, you're getting less exposure towards the other side. So the opinion line, line lying below the news line is consistent with this idea that when you consume something more opinionated, you get a, a, a less broad area of consumption. Um, but notice that social and search actually have higher opposing partisan exposure than direct navigation. What's going on here? Direct navigation, people are pretty boring. They're just going to the site they know, or a couple sites they know. Search and social might push the mean to the ends, but it's increasing your exposure to the other side also. So it's increasing your within user variation in a way that's biased towards one side, but is also giving you, say for search, a meaningful, a much more meaningful exposure factor three higher on opinion. Now, these numbers are still quite low, but look for news, it's up to 14%. Um, to some and to some extent, this gives a kind of causal channel for some of the findings Jesse and Matt had from their, from their previous paper. Uh, so what does this mean? I think this is probably the one takeaway we can think, think of in the paper. Echo chambers and filter bubbles are not the same thing. The echo chamber effect in our data is driven by direct browsing, not social media, and not personalization, okay? It doesn't, it's most pronounced for opinion articles, but it's most pronounced for direct navigation. People were boring. They were in an echo chamber due to their boring habits, okay? If you study people online behavior, you will realize they're very habitual creatures. Um, so search and social media, they do stuff, but they actually, they expand your, they expand your horizons. They might push you further apart, but they expand your horizons at the same time. Um, and the fact that these are two are not equal, the fact that uh, filter bubbles are not creating echo chambers, and the echo chambers that did exist are probably more similar to that graph I showed you of the newspapers, I think is an interesting takeaway. Um, so um, closing down, we find uh, similar results for opposing partisan exposure on Twitter. I don't have to mention that, we just saw that, so that's good. So here's some concerns, some caveats, and some concerns I have with the paper. We use outlet level ideology. And although we've eliminated a lot of stuff we don't think would relate to outlet level ideology, there's still a concern there. I'm showing you here, uh, we did unsupervised learning to get topics, and then we asked users to, I'm showing you Fox News and, and New York Times, we asked people on Mechanical Turk to uh, assess whether it was favorable towards Democrats or favorable towards Republicans, and I'm showing you here the net score, okay? As you go up, the topic is uh, as you go up, the outlets be more favorable towards Democrats, and as you go down, more favorable towards Republicans. Fox News lines are in red, and New York Times lines are in blue. This is from another paper. What you can see here is that across every outlet except one, drugs, Fox News is more critical of Democrats, and New York Times is more positive towards Democrats. Drugs, they kind of flip. Maybe it's such a dysfunctional issue that they both criticize the other side. Who knows? Um, but there's differences. So, for instance, on gay rights, Fox News and New York Times don't materially differ. And you can go read these articles. Fox News is actually very uh, progressive on their stance towards uh, in the DOMA hearings in our sample. Just happens to be a fact. So insofar as we're doing outlet level, level ideology for this topic, there's not a meaningful difference between the outlets. And so the segregation difference would overstate a true difference of informational exposure. A few other interesting patterns emerge. International topics seem to have a lower difference. And so like Syria, Iran, uh, and so forth have a lower difference than domestic political topics. And that might be a kind of rally around the president type effect. But again, for those topics, those numbers I gave to you might overstate the differences. Whereas, for instance, they might understate the differences about healthcare, which shows an enormous difference between the two outlets. Okay? 
Um, and it's mentioning things like Benghazi, it's hard to be that positive for the Democrats and so forth. But by studying the outlets, we miss this level of granularity, which might in some sense be the more important thing we care about, but we can demonstrate it here that there are differences and we didn't, you know, we could sort of calibrate the results with this, this follow-up. Um, and the last caveat is, uh, you know, not all, all articles are created equal. So is the fact that only 2% of hard news consumption is opinion from relatively polarizing channels important because that's the stuff that matters or unimportant because it's a small percentage? And I think that's not a question we can answer. Um, it would have to be, like we saw yesterday, studies that took that and linked it to other outcomes. I don't know what to make of it. It's just the lay of the land of the current equilibrium outcome we're in. Um, but the last thing I'll say is that that 2%, while it might make it hard for us to interpret, it does not make it hard for machine learning algorithms to interpret. Facebook, if 299 clicks are going to YouTube and BuzzFeed, what their personalized ranking is doing is showing people that you like that stuff because that's the vast majority of your clicks. So when you think about what drives machine learning, it's the volume of clicks. And so what this would say is that although it might be academically hard to interpret, it would say we wouldn't expect Facebook's ranking algorithm to really use these features since they seem somewhat not that important compared to the other stuff people are doing on Facebook. Okay, so I'll close with that statement. So the question I decide must be, you know, what's the effect of the ingestion of information referred via social media on outcomes of some sort, polarization, voting, how you vote, whether you vote, stuff like that. Now, given what the question must be, the mode of answering the question must be the following. Find some populations exposed to social media and some not, and then see how the outcomes vary. Now, that sounds hard, uh, but these, you know, these whippersnappers uh, are clever, so maybe they'll do that. Uh, now, of course, that's not quite what the papers do, although I do think it's the broad research agenda. I think it's the big question we care about, so it's, it's an unfair framing, but I wanted to talk in these terms to then maybe get these guys to talk a bit about you know, how many steps have they taken toward what you might think of as the deep, as the deep and important question. So what they actually do, uh, they assemble petabytes of data. And then they execute many instructions on computers. And then, uh, you know, this is impressive by the way, and earnestly, not just as a joke, according to many criteria, uh, not just the labor theory of value. You know, um, but no, no, seriously, <laughs> I can't resist the joke. But it is true, this stuff's pretty cool and impressive. But you know, when you go back to the kind of deeper, or I don't know deeper, but the big question about whether these new forms of information ingestion that are decentralized and so forth, whether they change what people know and therefore how they behave, um, we're not really getting direct information about that yet in this. I think you know, instead, uh, we're getting kind of whether the, uh, uh, you know, whether the communication via these new decentralized channels is sort of segregated. Now, if, if it's true, then that would be consistent with a mechanism that would bring about uh, you know, changed well, polarization and maybe changed behavior. But I think there's not direct evidence on this, on this question. Again, it's kind of an unfair, uh, unfair criticism, but I thought I would just lay it out, not as a criticism, but as a challenge. You know, how do we get to, to the answers to these, these kinds of questions? Uh, you know, this is, I was just thinking about, you know, if face, so face to face communication comes across on the side in these, uh, in these papers as very polarized or whatever, segregated and so forth. If it were a new technology, like if aspirin were invented today, it would be a prescription drug. Well, if face to face communication were invented today, it would probably, you know, it would be considered dangerous. We would probably discourage it uh, from the standpoint that it promotes polarization. All right, but that, that's, a, that's not so serious. The, the more serious, what I wanted to get the panelists talking about is kind of what question would you, you know, like to study? And I like to play this kind of omnipotent researcher game. You know, if you ran the world and you could observe everything and manipulate things, you know, what experiment would you run? What data would you collect? And, and what comparisons would you make? And, and I say this uh, against the backdrop of the fact that what they have done with the data they have is amazing. So we should appreciate what they've done. But I also want us to think about uh, I want them to talk a little bit about how do we get from here to understanding whether these new decentralized modes of communication change the stuff that we've traditionally cared about in thinking about how media affect behavior. I think that you know the it's it's certainly this is we discussed this some last night. I think this is a great um, way to frame up some of the discussion, and it's in incredibly true that even those of us who go off and build very complicated structural models and part of our life, when you start immersing yourself in all of this data and the measurement. Um, it just becomes sort of an end in itself to some extent, and it's so much fun. Um, I would say that I think it's, it's sort of healthy to start with describing facts because the first round of describing facts helps you kind of narrow down what's actually important. So I think, you know, like Justin, finding that, you know, actually, you know, 
social media is, is, is still a relatively small share of what's going on, that people are still doing a lot of direct navigation, finding that uh, the, you know, th that actually uh, uh, even of the stuff that they're reading, that a, a, only a small share is actually potentially politically polarized. So actually we find, we, ha we, we characterize things as potentially politically polarized that are not um, opinion articles, and we actually find that there's an overlap between opinion and politically polarized, but they're not, they're not sort of the same. Um, but, but you know, this, it's like a relatively small share of what's going on, so that's very important. And then understanding broadly like where the patterns lie then tells you where you're going to dive in and do more micromodeling. I'll say that the literature has had one, um, one line that has been sort of more in the natural experiments kind of um, paradigm, which gives you sort of a fairly clear view to answer to much more narrow questions. So um, that we have, I think, three papers uh, on news aggregators and looking at various natural experiments around news aggregators where a new set of content came on board. And so we definitely find this change that like when Google News brings on a block of content or takes away a block of content, that changes how people read the news. It exposes them to different things and it changes the diversity of their consumption and so on. Now the, the problem with those kinds of studies is that they're sort of in some sense fairly narrow and when you restrict yourself to a small time window and so on, you're only getting like a small piece of what's going on. So this alternative of like, okay, let's, let's really look out at everything people are reading much more broadly and try to describe it, I think is a good complement to those kinds of studies. And you know, I wish I had, you know, I wish I could turn people on and off and say like, okay, you guys, this half of the room just, you never heard of Facebook and this half of the room has, but you know, we can't really do that. And I should say that even if you had an experiment like that, I mean, for individual people, of course, this is all in equilibrium, so the news Art outlets themselves have been producing different news to because they're trying to get Ren Kiley on, I'm on, on, on search. Which experiment, yeah. I'm yeah. Which question are you interested in? Yeah. Right. So I'm not, I'm not saying I only want to see it as an experiment. I'm just saying which question would you want to answer? I know you can't do the experiment, but which one would you do if you could just to clarify what question you that, That's what I'm trying to say. I'm not asking for an experiment. Sure. So let me, let me give a couple and then I'll, let me kick over. But so with the news aggregators, the, there's some policy questions like, you know, does it, does, should we do something about the fact that Google News is stealing all your content? Is Google News actually helping the outlets by helping people discover content and read more news, or is Google News stealing page views and, and actually reducing consumption of news? So that's a policy question. I think from the, the social media perspective, I think what's, what's most interesting to me is how are these broad changes affecting the incentives for the production of news because of course the news can't get consumed unless it's produced. And then further, the equilibrium level of news consumption. And are we going to see different types of news getting produced and therefore different levels of informativeness? That's my question. So I, I think one way to frame your question is that there's almost two separate questions that the literature has tried to address. So one is what are the, what's the impact of the media on outcomes? Voting is kind of the most common thing that people look at. And then the other one is how do people choose which news to consume, and in particular, is there a preference uh, for like-minded news? And you know, I, th I think that the two certainly feed, feed together in the sense that uh, you know, the, the, the whole motivation for studying why people consume what they do is driven by the kind of implicit assumption that, that the media has an impact. Uh, and so, so I, but, but I agree that more work needs to be done. I, I liked the paper yesterday that kind of put these two things together in the sense of in one unified framework thinking about how people uh, choose what to consume, but also what is the impact of that. And, and, and I think that type of framework is very helpful because then you can look at this, this question of polarization, in particular, uh, if there's a preference for like-minded news and it impacts uh, outcomes does, or ideology, does that lead to increased polarization? Um, but, but I do agree in, in the specific literature on social media that there needs to be uh, you know, more work, and, and it's hard because we don't have some people exposed to Twitter and some people uh, not exposed to Twitter. I mean, some things that you could imagine doing, you could imagine doing some type of experiments on Twitter where you um, provide people with some type of content. It's also hard to see what people on, say, using Twitter data, it's hard to see what they do outside of Twitter, obviously. Um, you could think about linking it to voter registration statistics, for example. Um, that, that has a lot of challenges, though. You could think about doing surveys, and so th those are some, uh, some, some natural ways to go.
Yeah, so I think that the, you know, the ideal experiment isn't imagining a world without search. A world without search, I wouldn't work for Microsoft. I wouldn't be able to have that question, and therefore we'd have some kind of loop and a Terminator style loop that would explode. Um, so um, when you think about, when I say, we all could say that you know, based on the work we've seen today that search impacts news consumption. But on the other hand, we can't describe an ideal experiment where search is eliminated. And there are some people that would have the opinion that it's hard to assign causality if you can't think of an ideal experiment. But we're comfortable with the idea of assigning causality because we understand they got it through a search engine and it's hard to imagine getting that exact choice set without that Searching. There's a proximate causal element. So I think looking at those proximal causal relationships is interesting. One experiment you can do, for instance, a search engine has a feature that it retrieves information based on the language you use to talk to it. It's an element of information retrieval. If I have a different language model of the world, but the same opinion as you, based on, say, where I grew up, the search engine will pull back different results. And this is demonstrably true. This is a technological feature of how we retrieve information that affects exposure information. It would say a liberal person in the South is, without any sort of personalization, would be exposed to different information than a liberal person from the North. Search engines, for instance, people at Bing have done something where they interleaved search results. They took a search phrase that was associated with a certain topic that was used a Southern language model and a Northern language model, and then took those two results and interleaved them and lo which look at click patterns. And that sussed out some causal effect of the pure sort of language expression role in the choice that people got. That isolates some causal channel it's incredibly interesting, but, and it, it sort of gets at a level of causality we can get our head around and gives some credence to the fact that search is, has this causal relationship despite the fact that we can't imagine a natural experiment without it. Maybe just to, so I agree with everything that, that uh, Justin and Brian said. I would, I would say that it's, it's also interesting just to, to really understand how people get their information. Right. And so that's a sort of, part of my broader research agenda, like also using the same data, I'm looking at how people get financial information and linking that up to stock prices. So these, I think what, one of the things that the internet allows us to uncover is to measure mechanisms. And so, you know, experiments that, like I've done on the search engine of re-ranking results, you can show causally that just, you know, re-ranking things on the page has a huge impact on where people go. And so I think partly because we, we can now document we, we know that in the internet of all these long links, the only way you can find these long links is that somebody sends you there. And so we know the process of informing people is giving them these choice sets, and then they go. Now, so, so, and we know that we can manipulate those choice sets. So understanding that, therefore understanding the process by which people make choices from choice sets and understanding how different modes give you different kinds of choice sets I think is, is are, are, it just kind of under, it, these, are, these are really just fundamental questions about information and, and, and documenting and understanding the causal impacts of changes in those mechanisms of finding information have huge impl implications across all sorts of different um, industries and areas of economics. Any last words? Brian? Uh, thanks, Joel. Oh, thank thanks. thanks, Jesse and Matt, for organizing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> You're allowed to have a question. Um, so I want to ask, first of Brian and Susan, it's a, like, it seems like an important takeaway from the the paper is if the question is how is social media changing the way we get news and news content, the answer has to be not very much because the quantity is so small. So the yep. share of news content in the media remains tiny, and therefore we might worry about it for certain things but we shouldn't worry about it having a big effect on it. And I just want to ask you guys, based on your, Susan, your look at the same data, your data doesn't speak to that directly, but both of you kind of agree with that characterization, so you walk out of here thinking social media is interesting for various reasons, but it's not attracting news consumption. So, um, actually, I'm still, I'm still sort of mystified by how small it is. Like, I, I, I keep sort of um, trying to look at the data in different ways to see. It seems to be impacting the news outlets a lot from how they're talking about their experience and how they're changing their business practices. But yet, it's not showing up directly in the data. So I, I would say that I'm not fully... I'm not quite ready to 
say my final opinion on this, <laughs> but I would say one one thing. I mean, we're we're relatively neutral across. I mean, in, at least in my interest, across all of these different channels, search, news aggregators, and so on. And so I think there's a broader shift in the news outlets that they have figured out that they need to be concerned about how clickable their articles are, how they get ranked by search engines, how they get ranked by the Facebook algorithm, and so on. So that in aggregate, even though social media by itself is sort of small, it's sort of growing. But all of these things are, are governed by some of the same, all, all of the algorithmic, people besides me choosing how my articles get surfaced is, is, is become salient to the news. And so I think in aggregate, search and news aggregators and social media are inducing a supply response. But, um, but it's still, I, I agree with your, your point. And, and even though we have like all these huge data sets, you still get down to small numbers when you start to do kind of these micro analyses of user, you know, looking at user patterns over time because, you know, most people aren't reading that many news articles, they're mostly on YouTube, and then of the news articles they're reading, like a bunch of them are sports and celebrities, and then of the political articles they're reading, a lot of them are factual. And so then if I'm just trying to characterize an individual user, I'm, I've just got like, a, like two or three data points, I'm throwing out half my, you know, 80% of my data to get to people who I can even characterize. So that's a, that's consist. That's another implication of that fact. Do you have any other? Uh, I'll just make three quick points. Um, I, I believe on Twitter, some of the biggest accounts are are media outlets. So I guess it's there's a bit of an inconsistency there in terms of what people are actually doing uh, on social media. This is just a an, another conjecture is that different people are using it for different things. So I assume a lot of high school kids are. Uh, Using it to, to click on YouTube videos, and other people may be using it for, for I different I think means. everybody likes YouTube. <laughs> well, yeah, that's true. But the, the more general point is people could be using yeah, absolutely. it. Absolutely. There's a smaller things. set of people for whom it's very important. And yeah, so that's, that, that's another way to cut the, the data. So I, yeah, it's. It would be, if you talk to someone from the New York Times, that would be, now search is substantially bigger than social, like substantially bigger. And so I think they care a lot more about search page rank than, they do, than, than right now in terms of the traffic. But I'd, I'd add a few caveats to the characterization. I think that the mean being low doesn't necessarily imply there's not a subset of people that it is quite important for. Twitter does, on every study that's looked at it, looks far more political than Facebook. And I think there's, there are good lab studies that give us a reason why. Once my uncle got on Facebook, I'm not sharing anything political because I know this guy disagrees fundamentally with everything I believe in, and he's a jerk, a flat out jerk. And next time I see him, he's just gonna wanna talk about that. And so I think that <laughs> on Twitter, you, can, you have a, a more siloed group of uh, friends. Public versus public private. Public versus yeah. private. And it's not you, it's not necessarily your uncle, and I think that that um, on there. And so I think once Facebook is so big, it might be sort of too big to do this, but now, hey, my uncle loves sharing pictures. And so it promotes, it sort of goes, per, increase the utility on that dimension, but might decrease the utility on something controversial. So it might not be surprising given what we know about how people like to share. People are, in lab studies, incredibly reticent, reticent to share information that they fear might go against a group norm, or even if enough people in the room disagree with them, they'd rather stay silent. And that's been demonstrated over and over again. And so I think that could be factoring in why we see such low levels. It's not that people don't necessarily have a demand for sharing news, it's that there's a countervailing force pushing back against that desire in equilibrium. Matt, I just wanted to add something to that and, and uh, uh, discuss a little bit the issue of representatives. I think Lisa brought that up, so sort of what are the sample of voters that we're looking at, how they compare to other types of social media users. And so it would be a nice thing to see how our social media users compare to the social media users that, uh, uh, that um, Justin and Susan are using in their sound. They're, they're taking data from uh, users that are browsing the Internet Explorer, is that correct? That's right. And so there's issues of representatives over there. What type of people are using Internet Explorer and allowing themselves to uh, put add ons? Maybe they're older, less likely to use social media. So we have to sort of see how all this fits together. And uh, the types of people who use Twitter are clearly not going to probably have to guess that their proportion of news and opinion articles that gets through social media is much higher relative. Yeah, so one really very sad thing about my toolbar-based research agenda is that it's becoming obsolete. 
So it's, I mean, we, we still can use, actually, you know, there's other data sources. Toolbar is like this, the safest one to use for research, partly because it's a dying product, so nobody cares if we're in the newspaper talking about using that data for, um, you know, it's a, it's a, it's sort of less of a, of a big issue how we're using the data, and a lot of the users have opted in for research. But in some sense, Toolbar as a product is, you know, becoming less and less important, and more and more people are coming from mobile. So, you know, we know that most of Facebook is on mobile. Now on mobile, I mean, I think you're more likely to, to like actually read a full news article if you're browsing Facebook on the PC than if you're browsing Facebook on mobile. But say for Twitter, you know, you may be doing a lot of clicking on, on news links on Twitter, partly because I think the people sharing stuff on Twitter are also sharing stuff with the idea that people will be reading it in that way. And so, so as, as the shift to mobile happens and people are using more and more apps, um, and we're, we're, we're not as able to get access to all of the data that they're using to, to read news, um, you know, we're gonna have a harder and harder time getting a full picture of what people are doing. So from a research perspective, it was great when everybody was like in front of their PC and we could see everything that they were doing. It's also a problem for online advertising as well. When you, when you start going to all these fragmented mobile devices, you can't follow the people, you're not getting a, no, nobody has right now a full view of what a user does all day. Now, like Comscore, in some sense, is attempting to do that, but they don't have good mobile coverage either, or not full mobile coverage. So really, we were in this information gap right now about what people are actually doing online. Yeah, that's, that's going to be hard, I think, because you can't, Facebook, like there's, actually Facebook itself, I don't think, kind of captures that in a way, I don't even think if I was working at Facebook, I could fully do that, or at least I couldn't get the content of all of that, but um, I guess if I was working at Facebook, I could probably at least get measure like the frequency of comments or like the number of comments, those types of things might be, might be gettable. You could also imagine trying to text mine the comments section below an article online, although if you actually ever read those things, it's kind of skewed and crazy. So I, th I think people usually measure engagement by just time. There's actually a whole conference this summer that, that's organized by the media industry where the topic of the conference is how do we better measure user engagement with news? So I would say again, the whole online industry, advertising side, the media side, is all struggling with better ways to measure engagement. So BuzzFeed, like some companies do this by construction, so BuzzFeed, it, which is now more read, widely read than the New York Times by a factor of eight, um, they, for every news story they publish, they have a social boost they're measuring, which is how many shares they got on Facebook, and they get a ton. But by and large, these are like 21 cute cat things, like, like vast majority, because they, by, by that, this is what Susan is talking about, the equilibrium response there is that that's what they're optimizing towards. You just get so much more churn of page views. And it turns out there's a, I think, a, a bigger, bigger, higher utility, frankly. It's sort of like in Jesse and Matt's paper on that graph where the utility of the news out, like Yahoo News looked like super great because everyone just likes clicking on the, the story. It's like, sort of like a tabloid, I guess. And so BuzzFeed does this. It's their business model, fundamentally. And they've been insanely successful, but not through what we would consider traditional media content at this point, and it hasn't shown up with the traditional media outlets being as successful with the, with the strategy. So, and, but one of the things that's interesting about that, one of the reasons the, com the, the, the news outlets are so concerned about this is because they're, if, as they move to, to figure out how to get optimized, they have to become data driven. So they have to run their organizations around measures. If they put in only the measure of clickability, the New York Times becomes like, you know, BuzzFeed in yeah. like a day. Yeah. So, so you, and, and unfortunately, <laughs> right. yeah, exactly. it's, it's very, very hard though to measure the thing that makes them different than BuzzFeed. So as you become more data-driven and optimized and use A-B testing, all of the news outlets collectively will fall off a cliff unless they do something, they find better measures of long-term engagement. But it turns out that it's one, like Justin's paper about the fundamental unmeasurability of advertising effectiveness, there's also a fundamental unmeasurability of long-term user impact. Fundamentally, like you just don't have the statistical power to measure it. And so this is one reason when you asked in the very beginning, Joel, about like what are the questions, I, I see anecdotally a huge supply side response in methods 
And as they become more algorithmic, they're going to start responding to these things. And that really could affect what goes on. And even a company that's trying very hard, like a search engine, that's trying very hard to maintain the user experience, or Facebook, they're doing massive amounts of A-B testing to maintain the user experience. But all of us will say, oh, but our Facebook experience has gone down the tank. You know, Oh, they're putting up too many ads. Everything they do is data driven. It's all been tested, and not just short. I mean, they have experiments at Facebook that have run for like four years, OK? But they still can't use their data to show what we all kind of know intuitively, that actually, like, they're not, you know, it's not, they're, they're making us less engaged. Yeah. So this is, a, this is a really a fundamental problem that faces all websites, but it's especially important for news, because if they all drive themselves off a cliff, we won't have any good news. That's right. I mean, Yahoo, like a page like Yahoo or MSN, the front page is purely algorithmic. It's just based on click feedback and so forth. And you get a certain kind of content. It's, you can kind of go to those pages and see what clicks promote. And the New York Times, you could measure it. it. There is more editorial kind of foot in the sand. And probably that's due to a long run idea that the way they'll get subscription and differentiate their content is not by short run maximizing clicks. It's by being this sort of provider. Um, if they switch models to a short run model, they would become Yahoo pretty quickly. And I don't think, and if that started happening, it would be interesting, but um, that's what we're looking at. You know, that, that's, that these things would be measurable. You could actually measure with these sort of data the degree to which the New York Times responds to clicks throughout the day and the degree which other sites do. These are, again, questions towards Joel's that this is, since direct navigation is so important, what each individual outlet promotes is actually really important. It doesn't get a lot of attention. It's not as sexy. But with these data, you do have a rich enough data set. The time series would give you an idea of the kind of recommendation. That's something no one here has studied, but it would be a, in, in the same vein. Uh, interesting next steps.